Okay, yet I am sure there is loads of questions uh, happening now and will happen immediately after you finished. So, Thank you. thanks very much and we'll keep the Thank questions you. all to the end of this session and there is plenty. Uh, allow me to introduce Dr. Uh, Mohammed Gouda and if I select myself uh, one to be the best representative of a long journey that takes everything on board, MTI, speciality doctor, and then training scheme, and then to become a consultant at the end of this trip, I wouldn't myself any, select anyone better than uh, Dr. Muhammad or Mr. Muhammad Gouda. So Mr. Muhammad Gouda had his Masters of Science uh, and MD, then MRCOG, and he's currently working in the British system as a consultant in obstetrics and gynae in the Manchester University Foundation Trust and he is member of the National Obstetrics and Gynae Trainee Recruitment Committee across United Kingdom. So he had a long long journey starting from the scratch passing by all routes so I trust he's one of the best to talk about the speciality training scheme or the training scheme in the British system uh, without further ado, uh, Mr. Mohammed, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Walid. Um, just going to share my screen. Can everyone see this? We can see it. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Hisham Gouda. I'm Opsangani Consultant, and thank you, Dr. Ali, for the nice introduction. Today, I'm going to talk about the route to CCT, and um, I'll take you through different things, and at the end, I'm going to give you a conclusion, and I'll give you a bit of my experience and my advice about going through MTI, about being a specialty doctor, was uh, going through the Caesar pathway myself, as my nice colleague Dr. Mahmoud Becky uh, mentioned to you, and then achieving going into training and achieving CCT at the end. So, what is CCT? CCT is uh, short for Certificate of Completion of Training. And why do I why am I talking about CCT today? In the UK, you can uh, be a locum consultant or you can be a substantive consultant. The only way to be a substantive consultant is either through the CCT or through the CESAR, which my colleague mentioned, Certificate of Eligibility for Specialist Register. And there was something called CESAR CP, but it's not there anymore. And I'll tell you why. To become a local consultant, you can achieve that before a CCT and before a CESAR. And it can help you to achieve a CESAR pathway uh, later on. But you don't have to have them to become a local, but you need them to become a substantive consultant. What are the benefits of the CCT over Caesar? So, as so, this lecture uh, obviously is towards the end of the day, but the good thing about it is that uh, my colleague, Dr. Zaki, told you about the Caesar, and as you also, it is a very long process, and I myself was going through it. When the opportunity came to me to join training, I, to be honest, I was hesitant about it. And I will tell you why at the end of this lecture. But in few words, CCT is easier. CCC is definitely less paperwork, less hassle, less stressful, and less time consuming. It is recognized in other countries, including the Middle East, as you know, Caesar is recognized as well, but there is some discrepancy, unfortunately. There is no difference when applying for a consultant job in the UK. But some people say CCT is look better than Caesar, but to be honest, I don't know. This is what is told. What are the downsides of CCT? So as we know, anything in life has its benefits and its risks, and you need to weigh the benefits weigh the good stuff, weigh the bad stuff, and everyone is different. All of us has different circumstances. So what is the problems with CCT? First of all, it is difficult to go 
into training. It's very, very competitive. And before Brexit, and this is something which has just happened this year recently, and I came aware of it in April this year. Before that, anyone who went into training from the middle will have a CC, a Caesar CP, which is Caesar combined pathway. You will get a CCT if you go into training from the beginning. But because of Brexit, now anyone who enters training will go into will have a CCT, not a Caesar CP. Mr. Hashem, I'm sorry for interruption. Uh, there are three voices here coming to say your voice is not that clear, so they are having some troubles. Oh, sorry. Is this better? It's much better. Okay, sorry for that. No problem. Um, so now anyone who goes into training will end up with a CCT, not a CCT or a Caesar CP. Because of that, everyone wants to go into training. So now the competency is much, much difficult and uh, lots of people want to go there. The other problem is relocation. So you might be living in Manchester and your training comes in Birmingham or comes in Scotland. So you need to relocate, especially if you have children and, and uh, they are in school, obviously it's difficult. The other problem is rotating between hospitals. So each few months or every year in Ops and Dine, for example, you go from one hospital to another. It has its benefits that you expose yourself to different systems, different consultants, different ways to get more experience, but it can be a bit stressful because each time you go to a new hospital, you need to show your competencies and prove yourself. There is unfortunately no salary protection except for certain specialties like AME. So if you built up your CV as a clinical fellow or as a specialty doctor and you are put on a higher salary scheme, when you go into training, unfortunately, except a and &E, it's not protected. Mr. Good, I'm really sorry to interrupt you again. Yes, that position was much better. Okay. Okay. Um, how to get a CCT? At the moment, the only way to get a CCT is to go through training in the UK. There is no other way to do this. There is some negotiations that Caesar uh, should be changed to a CCT and there should be no discrimination between uh, doctors who go into training and doctors who go to do the non-training pathway. But at the moment, as mentioned, it's only CCT. How to apply for training in the UK? First of all, you should have a GMC registration and I'm sure you are all now experts after attending our conference today and with all my colleagues telling you about the ways to have this group lab, MTI, membership exams, uh, or other ways like the MMED to Edge Hill University or other universities. Now, the membership exam is different from one specialty to another. So, for surgery, for example, MRCS is very, very easy. Lots of people can do it at early stages and they can come to the UK. But for Ops and Gynae, for example, MRCG is quite difficult. And that's why I didn't go through this route myself. And it's sometimes difficult for most of the Ops and Gynae training. MRCP is quite in the middle. Do I need a CV? For training, you don't need a CV. For anything else, you do need a CV. So applying for an MTI, for a Caesar, for becoming a consultant. So. If you're planning to go for a training, you don't need a CV, but I would advise you to create one and start putting along any achievements or courses that you do, because believe me, you do a lot and you forget at the end to put it in your CV. How to apply for training? Now, to enter training, there is two ways. Either you go through a run-through program, which means you go through the beginning as an ST1, or in other specialities as a CT1, CT2, and then apply for an ST3. But in some trainings like Ops and Gynae, you apply for an ST1 and you carry on up to the end. Now, if you want to apply for an ST1, you need to go through an exam, which is called a multi-speciality recruitment assessment. But you have to be eligible for that. And to be eligible, you have to do an FY1, foundation year one, foundation year two in the UK, or you can do it abroad 
but you get a consultant here to sign you off that what you've done abroad is equivalent to foundation year one and two here. It is a free exam and uh, to prepare for it, there is a very nice website called Pass Medicine. I've put the uh, website link there. Uh, this website is unfortunately for a fee between 100 and 200 pounds. And it also covers most of the uh, questions which you will be asked probably in the, in the MSRA, including situation judgment uh, questions. And um, the good thing about it is that you, if you prepare well for this exam, the MSRA, and you pass a certain mark, you don't need to go for an interview uh, for the specialty. So lots of people who achieve very, very high marks in this exam, they go into training right away. You don't have to be shortlisted for an interview and then be interviewed and compete again against other people and either get the job or not. Now, what's the structure of the interview for an ST1? And I'll go through uh, the direct entry to ST3 in a bit. The structure of the interview, they will ask for you about the training uh, structure, and I will explain that in a bit. There will be a, most of the specialties, there will be a prioritization station where they give you a list of patients who are ill in a different ways, and they expect you to put the patients in a certain uh, order, and then say, what is your uh, management plan? And obviously, you have to uh, mention that you're going to escalate to your senior, either your reg, your consultant, uh, and if there is a patient that can be seen by a nurse or a foundation doctor, then you try to delegate that to them. You need to speak about your teaching and about your research, and I'm going to touch on that later as well, and your governance and leadership as well. Now, there is something which is good as well, which is direct entry into training as an ST3. This means that rather than going from ST1, which ST1 and ST2 is an SHO, ST3 is a registrar level. So you can enter in some specialties as an ST3, and obviously that saves you a couple of years. The downside in the past was that you were going to have a Caesar CT, but now, as mentioned, you will have a CCT. So that makes it very, very um, difficult because lots of people want to go to it and it's very competitive. The good thing as well is that you can accelerate maximum of two years, but this is up to the speciality itself and to the deanery, which means you can enter as an ST3 and then you can accelerate two years and become an ST6. And this is what I did, but I will mention that at my conclusion about my experience at the end. Now, the structure of this interview, there is a portfolio station. And again, every specialty is different, but most of them will follow the same structure. The portfolio station is, uh, before COVID, used to prepare a portfolio, a hard copy. You take it with you to the interview and give it to your interviewer, and they go through it and ask you through it. Now, because COVID, everything is online. Um, they will ask you certain questions about your portfolio. There is a pre-authorization station as well. That's an option diary. There is an OSCE station, which means uh, either you would have a, an examiner and ask you questions, so that's a viva, or you'll have a role actor, which acts like a patient, gives you a scenario, and there is an examiner to just see what you are doing, what your communication skills are, and this was covered also again this morning in our um, conference and professionalism is an important thing that should be covered in the afternoon as well by Mr. Ati. And both these things are very, very important when dealing with patients in the UK and obviously in general and in the OSCE stations. The next question will be, why do you want to do this speciality? Obviously it's different from one person to another, but you need to be saying stuff like, you've been passionate about this speciality all your life, what drives you to do this speciality? What do you like about it? And what will keep you uh, doing it? And if you've done two years of it uh, in it, 
say that. The other question would be, what is the challenges in the speciality? And this is something that you need to prepare before going to the interview, because this is a common question. So for example, in ops and dining, there is a high attrition rate. What attrition means that lots of trainees leave the training because it's quite stressful, because there's lots of unfolds, night shifts, and this is something which is well known. And sometimes they might actually ask you, what is your opinion about it? And what is your suggestions to get over this and avoid this high attrition rate? You need to know the structure of your training. So how many years? So if you're entering as an ST1 in Ops and Dining, you need to know that there's seven years of Ops and Dining. What exams you need to be done and when? So again, in Ops and Dining, you need to finish your first part MRCG before ST3, second and third part before ST6, and then higher training years in Ops and Dining 6 and 7, where you do uh, subspeciality training. And then you need to know what is the ARCP. So basically, ARCP is equal to appraisal, which is the yearly uh, evaluation of your training, and it's short for annual review of competency progression. Talking about teaching. Now, everyone, when they are asked about teaching, and unfortunately, trainees here in the UK as well, they only talk about their session that they have taught in, and that's it. While talking about teaching, you need to cover two things. So I like to put the three and three. So when you talk about teaching, you need to mention your qualifications. So what made you a good teacher? So in Egypt, for example, before becoming a lecturer, you take some courses to become a lecturer. Here in the UK, you need to go through two courses uh, which make you a clinical supervisor and another course to make you an educational supervisor and you can do a course called training the trainers. So if you've done any of them, you need to mention that under your qualification, don't forget that. And then organization of teaching. If you've done the organization of, so for example, in your hospital each week, we have a session where there is teaching. If you've organized this session, or you're organizing this weekly session for six months or for a year, don't forget to mention that. If you're organized a conference, for example, mention that as well and put what is your rule exactly in the organization. Because for example, organizing a conference is a big thing, so you can't do it on your own. So make sure to put your part in it. Um, teaching sessions that you have done. Now, again, three things to mention. Where did you do it? So for example, it's local or it's regional or an international teaching session. Who was your audience? Was it a group of senior doctors or senior and junior doctors or midwives and doctors and nurses and theater staff? This is important because that shows that you know your audience and you prepared your um, teaching session to be relevant for every one of them. And the most important thing that everyone forgets is the feedback. Always say, I've done this teaching session and I was very keen to look at my feedbacks and improve on any points that was highlighted to me. Now, research is also a, a question which will be asked. Not all of us have research. If you have, please mention master's and the PhD. If you don't have any research experience, don't worry. There is something called GCP, Group Clinical Practice, under the GMC. It's an e-learning, which you can do, and it's valid for three years. Please do it before any interview and please mention it to so say, I've done my GCP learning and I'm up to date with it. And you can also mention that you are helping in the research team, you're an active member in the research team at your hospital. So you're gathering data uh, for your recruiting patients. Um, and you're participating in national research projects. Each hospital in the UK will have a participation in national research project. If you have done a master's degree or an MD, mention what was your role? Were you only gathering data? Have you done the statistics? Have you done the analysis? Or have you done all of it? Like in Egypt, for example, you do most of it. What was the aim of your research? In a quick word, what was the outcome of this research? Don't forget this. And the most important thing, what have you learned from the research? Ethics, counseling, critical appraising papers, use of evidence-based medicine, 
one of the questions, is research important for every doctor or every doctor has to do research? Now, the good answer about that is not every doctor has to do a research job, but research is important in the life of doctors because what we learn from research, as I mentioned down at the end of the slide, and what have you been doing, and then you go to the GCP and the research uh, project that you have done. Now, there will always be a question about clinical governance, audits, and quality improvement projects. Again, we need to mention an audit quickly. So for you who want to know audits, try to read about it, but quickly audit is we want to know if we are doing the things in our hospital compared to our golden standards. So if there's a nice guideline saying, um, for example, in ops and dining, we need to give an antibiotic to any cesarean section for skin incision, then we need to audit our practice and see if we are doing that. If we're not doing that, why we are not doing that, and then we find the cause, and then we come with recommendations. And the most important thing is that we do a re-audit, let's say in six months time, and we can close the audit cycle. And this is very important to mention. You need to mention the name of the audit, why was it done, the aim of it, and the outcome of it, and, what, and again, what was the role? Were you just gathering the data, setting the standards, putting the analysis, putting the recommendations? Same as quality improvement project, which doesn't have to be a big project, like setting up a, a laparoscopy or, or a robotic surgery in a hospital it can be updating the guideline or updating the pathway. So my conclusion, CCT is an easier way to be on the specialist register uh, and become a substantive consultant. It can be difficult to get to training, but if you get, you read about uh, how ways to get into training, um, listen to uh, lectures about CCT and going into training and listen to this lecture and prepare well for your interview. And as we mentioned about the exam, all this can get you into training easier. I'll tell you quickly about my personal experience because I know we're nearly running out of time. So I did six years of ops and in Egypt. I did my master's degree and my, and my MBA in Egypt as well. And then I decided to come to the UK. So I came through the MTI program. I was uh, doing MTI for two years and uh, I finished my MRCG, which was my target. After that, I decided I'm going to stay in the UK. So I applied for the specialty doctor job, which is similar to the clinical fellow. And I was planning to go through the season pathway and I was preparing for it. After that, the training opportunity came for the first time in ops and dining to enter training as an ST3. So this was well known in medicine, in surgery, in a in a for example, in anesthesia, but not in ops and dining. So that happened in 2018. And I wasn't sure, shall I just carry on with this easy because I was newly there, or shall I go into training? And then I asked one of my consultants, and he said, with training, as long as you go to your job, you do your job well, with no catastrophes, you will be a consultant at the end without any hassle. While with Caesar, as you saw with Dr. Ahmed, it's a long process. It's not impossible. You can achieve it, but it needs lots of dedication from you. And uh, with training, you do your training, and at the end, you are a consultant. But unfortunately, with Caesar, you need to do your training, you need to do your documentation and your paperwork, and then at the end, you have to prove all this through submitting your uh, paperwork and documents. I went into training as an ST3. I accelerated two years, so I was an ST3 one year, and then jumped to ST6, and then ST7, and then had my CCT and became a consultant. So I finished seven years of ops and dining training in only three years. And this is something which anyone can achieve, and I would definitely advise this. Um, Dr. Atfel and uh, most of my colleagues explained about the other entries. My quick advice is if you just graduated, go for PAP. If you've done a few years, either go for a membership exam or PLAB or go to the MTI scheme. I would 
definitely advise you to try to go to training as quickly and as possible because there is lots of need in the UK at the moment and with COVID and with Brexit, things are starting to open up and I think this is a very good opportunity. Um, to go to training, you should be in the UK, but it doesn't mean that you have to be in the UK for many, many years. If you come for any, for even one year, you can use the, all the evidence you have for, in, for your training in the UK and the evidence you had in Egypt as well, which means before coming to the UK, gather your information, get your audits, get your paperwork to show that you've done audits or quality improvement projects. So when you're applying for your training, all your documentation is there. I hope all this helps. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so thanks very much, uh, Dr.